It's time to get used to the idea of a mini hatch with five doors. With this body style, you get a longer wheelbase, quite a lot more luggage space, and potentially room for three people in the back. On top of this, there's the third generation mini model sophisticated design with underpinnings better suited to longer journeys. Oh, and a range of punchy but economical engines. You wanted more mini? Well, you've certainly got it now. Take a standard Mini, add a dash of length and practicality, and you'd have a strong seller. You'd have a car like this, the Mini Hatch 5-door. The BMW brand talks of this design being the first ever 5-door Mini Hatch. Hang on though, doesn't the company's Countryman model already fit that description? Apparently not. Mini now markets that car as a small crossover segment contender, a kind of Nissan Duke style rival. In any case, the Countryman isn't affordable or efficient enough to properly appeal to Mini's core customer demographic, or more pertinently, people who might want to be in Mini's core customer demographic. There are, after all, potentially lots of folk who like the stylish frugality and fun, chuckable, cheeky demeanour of the Mini Hatch three-door model, but simply can't justify that car's tiny rear seats and restricted boots. Like me, perhaps, they've an occasional need to transport up to three kids in the back, and they require a car that won't be daunted by the modest proceeds of a family superstore shop. A car like this one? It's certainly going to be a strong seller for the brand, priced and sized in fertile territory, somewhere between Fiesta-shaped super minis and focus-sized family hatches. You can see why it might appeal, but would you really want one? Let's find out. Can a bigger Mini really feel like a proper Mini should? Fun, frisky, up for anything. The brand's Countryman crossover model tried hard in that regard, but was a little too heavy and perhaps even a little too sophisticated to quite hit the mark. This time round, though, buyers get the extra doors and at least some of the extra practicality they were seeking without any dynamic downsides, or none that I can feel anyway. If the stretched wheelbase of this car has done anything to dent the eagerness of the taut mini chassis, then I can't feel it. In other words, we're talking here of a package that on the road feels pretty much identical to that of the third generation mini hatch three-door models, which is a very good thing. Most buyers are going to want to go for one of the mainstream three-cylinder petrol and diesel variants, and triples always sound good low in the rev range, even if in other cars a lot of them create quite a din when you get up to speed. Especially if, like the 1.5-litre power plant fitted to the Cooper D model that I'm trying here, they happen to drink from the black pump. This one doesn't. You really have to know your engines to realise that this wasn't a conventional four-cylinder unit, but because it isn't, the burbling soundtrack delivered is so much more interesting, so much more mini. Which is an important part of the kind of cheeky, involving driving experience upon which this car's appeal stands or falls. Yes, people love the styling and the image, but one of these just has to put a smile on your face when you drive it. If the overall feeling you're going to get is of just another five-door super mini wearing a cute suit, you'd have to question this car's place in the overall scheme of things. I'd worried about this before driving it. The mini marketing people continually talk about go-kart handling, but that seems to be at odds with this hatch five-door model's longer wheelbase and extra weight. On top of that, until recently, you had front-driven minis and rear-driven BMWs, so minis were different and technically unique. But since Munich awoke to the benefits of the front-driven layout, that's no longer true. 
also under the skin, this car shares the same so-called UKL platform and basically the same engines as a volume BMW model, the 2 Series Active Tourer. Does that all mean that it loses a bit of its unique mininess? The answer is no, not really. Driving this car still delivers the same infectious naughtiness that loyal Mini followers love so much. There's still the darty steering and quick fire throttle response you'd expect. And yes, on pokier versions or variants, unwisely fitted with over large wheels, still the same unyielding bumpy ride over poor surfaces. Fortunately, for most models in the third generation Mini Hatch lineup, the issue of rock hard ride is less of a problem than it was for previous generation versions of this car. This is down to the way the newfound suppleness of the redesigned chassis makes this model a happier long journeying companion. That's something further aided by the much improved levels of refinement that are such a feature of this Mark III design. Mini reckons it's up to four decibels quieter than its predecessor. Indeed, in most guises, this is now one of the few small cars in this fashion conscious class that really are comfortable venturing further afield. It's only when you go for the sportiest two litre turbo models like the Cooper S or the John Cooper Works hot hatches that the ride firmness takes a, a turn towards the old days with a setup that's great when you're giving the car a good flogging but tedious the rest of the time when you're stuck with suspension settings that give you all the compliance of a Halfords trolley jack. Even here though, help is at hand, thanks to a box that I think Cooper S owners really need to tick if they're likely to be using their cars for more than a bit of weekend fun. Namely that for the sadly optional variable damper control setup. Now this enables you to switch the ride to suit the mood you're in and the road you're on and works through the mini driving modes system you get as part of the also optional chili pack. Here a rather hidden selector at the base of the gear stick enables you to choose settings that tweak throttle, steering and on automatic models gear change response between mid and green settings for efficient comfort oriented motoring and sport for when the road opens and the red mist begins to fall. Something echoed appropriately by a red glow around the central display and less subtly by a little picture of a go-kart and the phrase maximum go-kart feel. Quite. You certainly get that with the unyielding day-to-day -day ride of the Cooper S if you don't pay extra to add the variable damper control package into the mini driving mode system. Check out the more supply suspended models further down the range though and this additional feature may not be necessary. Try before you decide is my advice. Now I've talked about different models, let's get a little bit more specific. Essentially I reckon there are really four categories of mini hatch five door you can buy. I loosely describe these as entry level, affordable diesel, Cooper and potent hot hatch. And unlike say a rival entry level Fiat 500, all the variants on offer put out a decent level of poke. Let's start with the entry level rung of the ladder where even the base 1.2 litre petrol mini one hatch five door model manages rest to 62 miles per hour in 10.1 seconds en route to 119 miles per hour. Next up were the affordable diesel variants, the Mini 1D and Mini Cooper D diesel options, both using 1.5 litre power plants respectively putting out either 95 or 136 brake horsepower. In the lower powered unit of the 1D, that means 62 miles per hour in 11.4 seconds on the way to 116 miles per hour. While the more eager Cooper D I'm driving here improves those figures to 9.4 seconds and 126 miles per hour. Perhaps the sweet spot in the range though is represented by the variant that will deservedly be the best seller the petrol powered Cooper model. Here again, the engine on offer is 1.5 liters in size. 
actually basically the same unit that assists the electric motor in BMW's i8 supercar. Here, as there, it punches well above its weight, enabling the performance of this third generation version Cooper to at least aspire to the lower rungs of the hot hatch ladder. 62 miles per hour can be dispatched in just 8.2 seconds en route to 129 miles per hour, which I think will be quite as fast as most will really want to go in this car. To go quicker than this, you have to get your Mini in potent hot hatch form, which means having it with much firmer suspension and a much larger 2-litre four-cylinder engine up front. Either the 192 brake horsepower unit used in the Cooper S or the same engine tuned up to around 215 brake horsepower in the more extreme John Cooper Works version. Either way, the performance gains over the standard 1.5-litre Cooper model with its much friendlier ride and handling balance aren't massive. The Cooper S manages 62 miles per hour in 6.9 seconds on the way to 144 miles per hour. Still, that's enough to punt it into contention with a five-door super mini hot hatch benchmark like the Renault Sport Clio 200. Like that Renault, the joy the Cooper S brings to driving when you're in the mood for it is in its place as one of those cars that feels faster than it actually is, which is a very good thing in my book. To better get you through the twisty stuff, there's an EDLC, Electronic Differential Lock Control System, which electronically duplicates the kind of functionality you'd normally get from a heavier, more complicated mechanical locking differential. So it works through the turns to counter both understeer and wheel spin by lightly micro-braking whichever front wheel is threatening to lose grip. As a result, the car's kept planted through the tightest corners and you're fired on from bend to bend. Oh, and on the subject of brakes, they're really very good indeed, as befits a potential track day car. Large and extremely effective. Brilliant. The S really is a very fast car indeed these days. Get yourself one of those, then slot it into fourth gear at a pedestrian 30 miles per hour before flooring the throttle, and it'll arrive at 70 miles per hour quicker than 230 brake horsepower's worth of Volkswagen Golf GTI. But even lesser mini hatch five door models like this Cooper D variant have plenty to offer the owner who likes his or her driving. I've already talked about the way you can tailor the steering and suspension to your taste. And the six-speed gear change 2 is a huge improvement on the bulky old box that many owners have had to battle with in the past. Not only because the throw's shorter, the perfectly positioned sticks nice too, and the snickety actions particularly satisfying, but also thanks to a clever gearbox software that even instructs the engine to blip the throttle on the down change, so it sounds as if you've mastered the perfect heel and toe technique and your friends will think you're the next Lewis Hamilton. If you can't be bothered with all of that, there are two six-speed auto transmission options on offer. The more desirable sports setup featuring shorter shift times and steering wheel paddles. The worst mistake any freshly designed Mini can make is to lose its mininess. And much of that is, after all, tied up in this model's diminutive dimensions, which, as it happens, aren't so diminutive these days, thanks to this third generation hatch design's small but significant increases in width, height and length. To these enhancements, the hatch five-door variant adds 161 millimeters of length and 11 millimeters of height over its hatch three-door sibling. All of this thanks to a wheelbase stretched by 72 millimeters. Does it all work aesthetically? Well, you'll be the judge of that. What I will say is that if you like the look of the hatch three-door version, the changes made here are subtle enough to probably keep you loyal to this, its bigger stablemate. Mini's first five-door model, the Countryman, was quite a big step away from what people expected the brand to deliver. This car will be much easier for the brands faithful to follow. 
Visually, it certainly retains quite a bit of this maker's trademark get up and go with the wide track, the short overhangs and a window graphic that tapers to the rear, all contributing towards quite a dynamic wedgie 3D shape that's further aided by the striking sill line that runs between the front and rear wheel arches. Familiar mini touches include the circular headlights offered with lovely optional LED rings, the clamshell bonnet, the upright windscreen, the continuous band of chrome at the base of the glass house and the blacked out uh, pillars that create the so-called floating roof. All of it's present and correct, along with the familiar side scuttle side indicator surrounds the upright rear light cluster and the black periphery around the bottom edge of the bodywork. Another traditional design feature is the seamless hexagonal contour of the front radiator grille with ribs trimmed in high gloss black for Mini 1 models and in white aluminium for Cooper variants like this one. Cooper S and Cooper SD models get a sportier honeycomb grille finish along with additional air intakes in the bonnet that are purely there for aesthetic effect. That bonnet is pitched higher in this third generation mini hatch design in order to meet updated pedestrian safety legislation. One of the reasons why the finished front end look of this car isn't quite as cute as either the original Izzy Gonis design or the earliest turn of the century Frank Stevenson style BMW version. That said though, there's certainly enough brand DNA here to make this car as instantly recognisable as anything on the road. But let's focus on what we're here to analyse, the differences that this hatch five-door model delivers over its hatch three-door stablemate. And nearly half of the extra length you get with this variant has gone into providing extra rear seat space. Though to some extent the issue lies in getting to it, these extra rear doors are really pretty small, so squeezing in and out can be pretty tricky. Once inside on the rear seat though, the news gets better. Anyone who's ever been crammed into the back of a mini hatch three-door model for any length of time will be astonished by just how much space has been created here simply by increasing the length of the car by a mere 161 millimetres. Partly thanks to these deeply sculpted seat backs, you get 72 millimetres more rear legroom than you would in the smaller model, and that height increase is welcome too, freeing up 15 millimetres more headroom. There's even 61 millimetres of extra interior width at elbow height, despite the fact that all mini hatch models share the same exterior width. This is the first mini hatch to offer more than two seats in the rear, though I'm not entirely sure about the brand's claim that this makes the car a genuine five-seater. The middle rear pew is, after all, next to useless for all except very small children, thanks to this huge transmission tunnel. Still, a couple of adults will be surprisingly comfortable, even on longer trips. Yes, even if they happen to be six-footers. On to boot capacity, the aspect that more than any other Mini owners have previously moaned most about. With this hatch five-door model, you certainly get more of it. The 278 litre total being 67 litres up on that available in the hatch three-door version. You still don't have to think of this cargo area as being super mini sized, it's about the level of space you'd get in a Fiesta or a Corsa. And given that many buyers will be considering this car as an alternative to a larger Focus or golf sized family hatchback, that might still make this trunk area feel a little small. A Golf does, after all, give you 380 litres, the kind of capacity that makes it a lot easier to get things like push chairs in and out. Still, provided you don't mind that, there's plenty to like here. You get one of those clever movable floors that can be set at two separate heights. Though the downside to that is the lack of a proper spare wheel. There's also an optional storage package so you can make the best use of the space that you do have. And the angle of the rear seat backs can be adjusted into two positions so that you can prioritize the needs of either passengers or luggage. 
If you don't have to worry about rear seat fork and have more to carry, then pushing forward the 60-40 split folding rear backrest can free up as much as 941 litres, up from 731 litres in the three-door model. Enough on practicality. Time to move up front. Here, you really do feel that you're in something a little larger than a Super Mini and something a little nicer too. Mini's other five-door model, the Countryman, is built for the brand by Magna Steer in Austria. But this hatch five-door model rolls down exactly the same British mini plant Oxford production line as its three-door counterpart and is built to the same high quality. If your previous experience of a modern era Mini is limited to the older Mark I or Mark II models with their brittle trim and questionable ergonomics, then a seat in this third generation design may prove to be quite the eye-opener. The driving position feels a bit less upright and the three-spoke leather trimmed wheel feels nicer to hold. In the old model, you had to worry about this obscuring this slot into which you had to press your ignition key to start a thing. That silly slot's been ditched too, replaced instead by a neat starter switch in the middle of the familiar row of toggle controls that have survived at the bottom of the centre stack. In short, everything feels a good deal more substantial in this car, a good deal more grown up. To that end, you get these impressively supportive seats with their wide adjustment range and lengthened base that gives you plenty of comfort and support. There's a proper rotary control for the lights, electric window switches that, at least on modern minis, have been located on the doors where everyone else puts them. Plenty of interior storage space with two glove boxes, additional cup holders and space in the seat backs and front passenger footwell for the storage of bottles and maps. Oh, and a whole series of lovely touches, like the way the start-stop tab features a heartbeat illumination which pulses before the engine has started, or the LED perimeter lights of the central display that progressively light up the perimeter of the screen as you switch driving modes, engage the engine stop-start, cope with parking or count down to your next sat-nav turn-off. Ah yes, the central dash display. As ever in a modern Mini, it's still dinner plate sized, but these days doesn't house an almost indecipherable speedometer. That's been relocated to a pod above the steering wheel where it's flanked with a crescent moon rev counter and fuel gauge. All of this has freed this central area up for much more infotainical trickery marshalled via optional 6.5 or 8.8 inch multifunction colour displays you'd want to try and pay extra for, since the alternative is a cheapskate looking four line TFT readout. Though crying out for touchscreen functionality, the colour layouts are actually marshalled by this classy, effective iDrive style controller down by the thankfully conventional handbrake. If, like me, you were under the impression that prior to the launch of this car, Mini already made a five-door model, the Countryman, you'll be wondering how this car prices against that one. The answer is that it offers a model-for-model -model saving of around £2,600, as it probably should do given that this is a smaller design. That means Mini Hatch 5 door pricing starting at around the £14,500 mark which, if you do the maths, means a £600 model for model premium over the directly comparable hatch three-door version. That doesn't seem an unreasonable markup. The range directly mirrors that of the three-door model lineup, so at entry level in the £14,500 to £16,000 bracket, buyers will be choosing petrol or diesel versions of the budget-oriented Mini 1. Most potential customers, though, will want to find £16,000 or more to stretch to mid-range Mini Cooper level. And here there are decisions to make. As either a petrol or a diesel Cooper buyer, you need to weigh up whether it's really worth finding the significant chunk of money that's necessary to progress from the entry-level 1.5-litre unit to the pokier 2-litre option. You're talking of around £3,000 or so to go from the 
Cooper to Cooper S or from Cooper D to Cooper SD. The kind of figure that would take the cost of this Mini up towards the £20,000 mark. Make sure you can really justify your need for that extra performance. Most models offer the option of six-speed automatic transmission for a premium of around £1,300. And for would-be Alonzos, there's a further racier sports automatic setup with steering wheel paddle shifters and rev matching on downward gear shifts. Your perception of the value proposition all of this represents will, as ever, depend very much on your point of comparison. The issue is what this should be. With a mini hatch three door, we all knew where we are. This car up against fashionable little three door hatches like Alfa Romeo's Mito and Citroen's DS3. But those are three door only models. So what might you compare against a mini hatch with five doors? The answer is not immediately obvious. After all, the boot capacity of this car suggests you should pitch it against a Fiesta-sized Super Mini, but few potential customers will, primarily because the engine outputs across Mini's lineup have more in common with those you'd find in a larger focused-sized family hatchback. So this Mini Hatch 5 door falls between these two established market segments and it's priced neatly between them too. Customers interested in this car will in any case be looking for something a little more interesting than a mainstream Super Mini or a family hatch. Fiat has developed a five door version of its dinky little 500 model to try and reach out to those people and an extended wheelbase 500L model too. In both cases, though, Fiat can't offer the level of engine output across the range necessary to compete with this Mini. A closer match would probably be Audi's A1 Sportsback. In diesel terms, the Audi can undercut this Mini slightly on price, but you pay for that saving with inferior performance. As for petrol power, if you're looking at a standard Mini Cooper, a directly comparable A1 1.4 TFSI is not only slower and thirstier, but would cost you around £1,400 more. Now, beyond the Audi, I'm really struggling to think of realistic alternatives that would please a likely buyer of this car. Perhaps one of the smarter mainstream brand family hatchbacks might suit. Maybe a Volkswagen Golf or a Honda Civic perhaps. Maybe even a Citroen DS4. For all these cars though, you'd be looking at having to find a model for model premium of around three to four thousand pounds over the cost of this Mini. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a five-door mini hatch that you really want, what can you expect to find included before it's necessary to resort to the brand's notoriously long options list? Well, your first task as either a petrol or diesel buyer is to select the size of the engine you want. Go regular with the three-cylinder 1.5-litre units fitted to either the Cooper Petrol or Cooper D diesel variants, or go large with the two-litre units found in the Cooper S Petrol or Cooper SD diesel models. Whatever your choice, you'll find a reasonable foundational specification from which to begin what will probably be a very individual personalization process. For the sake of argument though, let's assume that you're one of those vanishingly rare people likely to walk into one of the company's dealers and hand over the asking price for an entry-level mini hatch three-door variant with no options at all. In such a case, you'd find that the standard spec of your car would run to alloy wheels, front fog lamps, daytime running lights, power heated door mirrors, air conditioning, Bluetooth connectivity, a keyless starting system, a trip computer and the mini central display with illuminated ring and a decent quality DAB stereo featuring both AUGs in and USB sockets. From there on in, it's down to the level of restraint you can bring to bear on the tempting accessories list. One surprising omission here is the option of a tow bar. So many hatch five door customers wanting to hitch up a small trailer to take their rubbish to the dump or maybe their scrambled bike or go-kart to the next meeting are going to be somewhat disappointed. 
You can, though, pay extra for the usual roof racks and bike carriers. Inevitably, though, the most popular extra cost items on this car will be fashionable fripperies. Things like stripes, decals and custom finishes for the roof, exterior mirrors, bonnet, seat upholstery and interior surfaces. Maybe also the John Cooper Works rear spoiler and your choice from the vast array of alloy wheel styles with rim sizes ranging from 15 to 18 inches. But of course, that's just the starting point. Once you've got the look and the feel of your car right, it's time to sift through the much longer selection of high-end features now offered on this model. A process that'll be much simplified if you start by ticking the box for either the base pepper pack or the plusher chili pack, as almost all mini buyers do. Pepper people get things like dual zone aircon, auto headlamps and wipers, a storage compartment pack and a sport leather steering wheel. You also get the mini excitement pack which gives you sports instruments and a downloadable app that shows you engine output and torque along with the cringingly named excitement analyzer that assesses the sportiness of your driving and a force meter that shows you the current g-forces at work on you and your passengers. If, like most mini folk, you can stretch your budget even further into the chili pack, your car will also come with larger 16-inch alloys, white indicators, sports seats and the mini driving mode system that enables you to select between mid, sport or green settings depending on how efficient you want your journey to be. And beyond that, well, I'd suggest that driving mode system to be incomplete without adding variable damper control to it for a few hundred more so that you can tweak the ride quality as well as steering, throttle and gear change response. Now, elsewhere on the options list, I'd want run flat tires and the storage package to make the most of boot space. Beyond that, well, I wouldn't listen to the optional Harman Kardon stereo if you're someone easily parted from your money. Many will also be tempted by the lovely LED headlamps. And if you want to go even further, you can splash out on things like a panoramic glass roof, roof rails, windscreen heating, seat heating, and a park distance control system that'll even better guide you into the tightest spaces if you also go for the rear parking camera. Maybe you'll also want the head-up display that's found on a little panel that rises at the base of the windscreen. Talking of displays, many mini motorists will certainly be minded to make the most of the cabin's iconic central screen. Now that it no longer serves as a speedometer, it seems rather underutilized with a dinner plate sized display showing nothing more than a four line TFT readout in standard models. Fill it though with the optional 5.5 or 8.8 .8 inch color screen controlled by one of the center console based iDrive style mini controllers and it's all very different. This shows a wide range of vehicle functions. Some of these better illustrated by a pretty ring of LED lights that progressively light up the perimeter of the screen and can help with anything from parking maneuvers to a change in your driving mode or the distance before your next sat nav turnoff. More expected elements to be found on this main display include infotainment, navigation and the various mini connected services that come packaged up either in standard form or in the more advanced mini connected XL guys I have here. These systems allow you to seamlessly integrate smartphones, so enabling the use of internet-based services for uh, entertainment, communication and driver information. Now there's network navigation and real-time traffic information too, thanks to the XL package's clever journey mate function. Mini Connected is also the way into online-based services such as web radio and the use of social networks like Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare and Glimpse. It's also the way you'll be receiving RSS news feeds and entertainment features such as Deezer, Napster and TuneIn. 
On to safety and a level of possible provisions that seems an awful long way from the model founder Alex Izigonis' original thoughts on the subject way back in the 60s. Asked about the crash worthiness of the Mini, he said, I make my cars with such good brakes and such good steering that if people get into a crash, it's their own fault. Well, thankfully, things have progressed a bit in the safety department since then. There are anti-lock brakes, of course, with electronic brake force distribution to make them even more effective, and cornering brake control to help you through the turns. So you're always primed for a swift stop. There's tire pressure monitoring, fading brake support, and a clever brake drying function that will imperceptibly dap the discs in wet weather to keep them dry. There's also the usual stability control systems and a DTC, dynamic traction control setup, that in poor conditions allows a bit of control slip at the drive wheel, so moving away on loose sand or deep snow can be a little smoother. If all of that isn't enough to avoid an accident, then Isofix child seat fastenings, a pedestrian friendly bonnet and twin front side and curtain airbags will all be welcome features. In going further, your first option is to tick the box for the driving assistant pack I have here, based around a camera-operated cruise control and distance control function that's there to automatically maintain a predetermined distance to the vehicle ahead. It will also dip your high beam for you at night and display road signs on the dash as you pass them by. Best of all, a clever collision and pedestrian warning system is included that scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards. If one is detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond or aren't able to, the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Another smart idea is the optional e-call intelligent emergency calling system. In the event of an accident, this setup automatically detects the vehicle location and accident severity before contacting a call centre to initiate fast and effective assistance. That could be a lifesaver. I suspect, though, the good Sir Alec would have hated it. Mini needs a five-door hatchback in its model lineup, and one of the reasons why the larger Countryman models doesn't quite fully meet that requirement is that due to a combination of slightly heavy weight and older tech engines, its running cost returns aren't especially Mini-like. Let me illustrate that for you. A uh, petrol-powered Countryman Cooper manages 47.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 137 grams per kilometre of CO2. Now, in comparison, a mini hatch five-door Cooper model manages 60.1 miles per gallon and 109 grams per kilometre, which is far more like it. It's the same story further up the range, since a mini hatch five-door model is hardly any more expensive to run than a frugal little mini hatch three-door, it'll cost you around 15 to 20 percent less in terms of fuel economy and CO2 than a comparable mini countryman. Now, the entry-level Mini 1 petrol variant manages 58.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 112 grams per kilometre of CO2. Even the 144 miles per hour hatch five-door Coupe S variant manages 47.9 miles per gallon and 136 grams per kilometer. Of course, if you're really serious about maximizing your running cost readings, you'll find that very little gets close to a mini diesel. Predictably, best of the bunch is the 95 brake horsepower Mini 1 diesel, which returns 80.7 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 92 grams per kilometre of CO2. Nearly as frugal and clean is the 116 brake horsepower Mini Cooper D that I'm trying here. Keep an eye on the standard gear shift indicator and an impressive 78.5 miles per gallon combined return is theoretically possible along with emissions of just 95 grams per kilometre. Hybrid power? Who needs it? 
Even the 170 brake horsepower Cooper SD isn't far behind, managing 68.9 miles per gallon and 109 grams per kilometer. As you'd expect, there are a whole host of what the brand calls minimalism technologies that help this car achieve such good efficiency. These include the basics that these days you might expect, slippery aerodynamics, brake energy regeneration, the reduction of engine and transmission internal frictional losses, and ancillary engine systems that operate only when called upon rather than constantly pumping away in the background. Plus, of course, a stop-start system to cut the engine when you don't need it, say stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Automatic models can also work with the mini navigation system to take account of your selected route and better control your gear shifts to suit. To further build on that approach, the driver can better play his or her part with a couple of optional systems that should further help to drive your running costs down. First up is the mini driving mode system I have here. Now it operates via use of this rotary switch at the base of the gear stick, allowing you to switch from a default mid mode to self-explanatory sport or green settings. Green mode modifies throttle and transmission response and tweaks the standard gear shift point display. It also includes a so-called coasting function where at high cruising speeds the drivetrain is temporarily decoupled for extra frugality when you come off of the accelerator. The onboard computer includes two readouts which demonstrate the effect of the fuel saving all this creates. One that shows the extra mileage available and another that shows the reduced energy consumption. Finally, there's the minimalism analyzer you can add as part of the mini connected package. There to score your driving and guide you towards more economic progress. It might initially seem to be a bit of a gimmick, but owners who've used it reckon on fuel economy improvements of between four and eight miles per gallon. What else? Well, residual values are bound to be strong. The three-year retention figures you get with mini models are always well above the class average. That'll also be helped by the way the mini reliability improves with each generation, something evidenced by falling warranty claims. As expected, there's the usual three-year unlimited mileage warranty with the usual BMW-style variable service indicators. And on that subject, most all mini buyers opt for the no-brainer TLC package, which for around £300 gives you comprehensive servicing cover for five years or 50,000 miles, whichever is reached first. This also includes a mini MOT protect assurance guarantee, stating that in the unlikely event your car should fail its first, second or third MOT test, Mini will cover the cost of repair or replacement on an array of selected parts. Finally, I should mention insurance groups, which are the same as those for the hatch three door. You're talking group 11E for the Mini 1D, group 12E for the Mini 1, Group 15E for this Cooper D, Group 18E for the Cooper, Group 25E for the Cooper SD, and Group 26E for the Cooper S. In one sense, it's extraordinary that it took the Mini brand so long to bring us this car. After all, over 70% of all sales in the small hatchback segment are of five-door models. In not offering a conventional Mini hatch with that option, this franchise was missing out on a significant number of sales. With the extra doors in place and this car in the showrooms, the company's position in the compact hatch sector has changed significantly. After all, in the eyes of many potential customers, the extra versatility of this variant will turn what was previously an unbuyable car into a really credible proposition. You have to know what you're getting, of course, though the engine range can certainly offer the power and technology you'd get in the best focus-sized family hatchbacks. The rear seat passenger room and boot space of this model can't quite match the best players in that segment. 
This Mini gets reasonably close though. Priced and pitched to hit a tempting sweet spot between the Super Mini and the family hatch sectors that will suit many buyers perfectly. For these kinds of people, the news that they can have one of these for less than the price of an ordinary Focus or Astra will be music to their ears. That affordability is key, given that high-ish pricing was one of the things that put some buyers off the Mini Countryman model that represented the brand's first stab at five-door motoring. Here, though, the sticker figures seem to be right and have been matched with strong British build quality and this third-generation hatch design's classy, endearing feel. Best of all, perhaps, the extra length of this variant has done nothing to dilute its fun factor. It's still a great choice for the young at heart.